again from Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, being a sent one, and a sent one. It's funny, isn't it, how uh, uh, some words in Greek get translated into English words and others just translated into like Greek words. Apostle. It's really not, it's a, it's not a translation, it's just a, it's like, apostle. It's like, we can be bothered to translate it, we just, we'll keep that one. But it means sent one. Paul, a sent one, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, so it distinguishes between Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with him to the churches in West Bridgeford. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that he adds in the word Lord to Jesus and Christ. So we have Jesus the person, we have Christ his identity as Messiah and King, and then we have Lord, the one who is risen in the centre of our time, who rules over all things and is to come. He's the one that the Lord has been gripped with and he met on the road, and so he's very keen to add the word Lord so that the Gentile believers and as well as the Jewish believers can understand who this Jesus really is. So he just summarizes the gospel in three words Lord Jesus Christ. Nice summary right there. Who gave himself? Jesus is, for Paul, is a self sacrificial God. If there is a God, what kind of God does Jesus represent? I was talking to a, a load of teenagers this week at uh, my first assembly at Rygate Grammar School. They all came in in their uniforms and sat in our church for the first time uh, while I'd been there. And they sat there and I was absolutely petrified with 300 sick boys sitting at me looking disinterested. And, uh, somewhere we came across the room and, and I felt all my energy left me. And I had to pray, God, help me right now. And, and, um, and I found myself talking about the frustration that led Jesus to the cross. And I said, I don't know, because of course most of them don't believe in God or don't have a way of talking about that. And so I said, you know, I, I wanted to tell them that if they did believe in God, what kind of God would Easter tell them about? And I told them that this God, the story of Easter is an interesting story because it's brutal and violent and ugly. It's not nice. Certainly not nothing to do with chocolate. And it's very interesting because it's so, so horrible. And, and I wanted to catch their attention and not just think Easter nice but, but rather, and yellow, but rather Easter grey and dark and fearful, and betrayal, and denial, and, and all the broken things, and I just want, and, and they know the experience of brokenness, they're kids, they know what it is to be, they know denial, and they know brokenness, and they know fear, and they know disappointment, they're kids, and they, they've gone to school, and they're now in the sixth form, they've got the wounds, you, you understand what I'm saying, and they, they're struggling because they live in a world where there is no narrative and they have to make sense of the world with their own ideas and the internet to help them, which isn't very much help. And so they're, they're trying to make sense of it. And I said, what kind of God does this story tell us about? It says, here's a story of a Jesus who gives himself away, a God who gives himself away for you. He's so frustrated with the way the world is that he's willing to even enter it and pick up the mess upon his shoulder. And he's willing, he's willing to enter into this. I didn't say the word, but I, if I had been more... If the teachers hadn't been in the room, I would have said crap. <laughs> My mum always said, don't say crap, it's wrong. I said, it's just, it's just the words, it's just crap. <coughs> and now I understand what she's saying. As an adult, I understand what she's saying. <laughs> but every now and again, I like, it feel, because that's what it feels like, isn't it? It's a difficult place, this, this world's beautiful, but it's also full of brokenness. And, and Jesus enters into that brokenness. And for Paul, it's the one who gave away himself. He had everything, Philippians 1 or Philippians 2. He who had everything, gave up everything and took up upon himself this thing. And so Paul wants us to know that this is the God who Jesus, who Jesus represents. He's the self-sacrificial God. Why did Jesus sacrifice himself, though? Why did he give himself away? It's because it was a battle. I said, well, what's the word association again with Easter? So the person next to you. If I say Easter, what do you think of? And then I asked them, and I said, did anyone say battle? Not one of them said battle. Because that's what it is. It's a battle. Jesus was set like a, his face like flint towards Easter in order, to, in order to fight this battle. And he knew this battle was going to cost him everything, this cup that he was going to hold. And it was painful and ugly, and he didn't want to face it. And if there's another way, Lord, I'll take it. But there wasn't another way. He knew it was going to cost him everything. So he runs towards this battle. And he says, if you want to follow me on the battle, that it's going to cost you as well. You're going to have to pick up your cross because there's nowhere to lay your head. It's going to be very difficult to follow me. Are you sure you want to follow me? Because it's only going to end up in one place. You're going to have to pick up your cross every single day and follow me. Because there's a battle going on. And, and the reason there's a battle is because I'm not done with the world yet. And I'm angry against the way the world is, says God. Not because I don't like people, but because I do like people. Just as we're angry with ourselves sometimes. Not because we don't like ourselves, but because we do like ourselves. Does that make sense? 
You know, you're frustrated. The gap between what is and what could be. <coughs> and you're frustrated and you look at yourself. Whether it's your body, your health, or your academic achievements, or your or how your relationships are, or all those things. There's a gap, and there's an irritation there, and it's a, it's a good irritation. Not all irritation is bad. I've had to learn that in my life. You know, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's not helpful, but other times it's really helpful, because the irritation is the energy that you need to make a difference in your life. If you're not irritated, you're probably static. And so we need to be irritated. And so God is so irritated about the world that he sent his son. And we translate that, he loved the world so much. And that's exactly what it is. It's a passion. It's a fiery passion. He will do anything to win it back and destroy the work of the evil one. So he says this, Paul, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. There's a battle going on for our souls, for the way that the world is. And Jesus comes in to enter it, to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever. And then he says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, different good news, which is really no gospel at all. See, the story is, is the same even in those early days. People got used to the gospel and they threw it away very easily. And we do the same. We have this gospel and we need to, we need to recapture it again. And, and in a way, we do that every time we meet the bread and wine. We tell us the gospel story, we just repeat it. But even that becomes becomes part of the, the wallpaper of the world, doesn't it? It just becomes normal for us. And so we get the power of it over us. And we need, to, we need to recapture it. So this is what I want us to do in this session, God willing, that we will recapture the passion that we have for this incredible story, the one that think first won our heart. Where's Mike? You know, four years ago, that story that, that, that caught your heart and rescued you from the world, from the way that you felt, and you just didn't want it. And you came to Lee, and I don't want to tell your story for you, but you came to Lee and said, I, I want a new life. And that raised, we need to, four years is a long time to hold that. And, but we need, and some of us are longer. How, how, how long is your story? We need to remember what it is to be rescued if we're going to rescue anyone else. We need to remember what it is to be rescued if we're going to rescue anyone else. So the main challenge is that we're living in a post-Christian culture, but we don't know it. We're asleep to it. And we assume that we can turn this thing around with a few techniques, and they, they won't work. Uh, I don't want to ruin anyone's party, but messy church will not save the world. <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not sufficient. I don't know if you have a monthly prayer meeting. Do you have a monthly prayer meeting? How many? 10? 15? How many people come? 20? Should I go up or go down? Stay there. Stay there. It's insufficient. <coughs> Isn't it? Think about it for a moment. The remnant, the remnant of God in West Bridgeport, and they pray, and there's 30 of us. It's the same in every church. We call them, we, vicars like ourselves, we call them first priority prayer meetings in order to make people come. <laughs> Very disappointing. <laughs> we know that it's not the first priority. Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray. They met together in their homes regularly. Every day they met in the temple courts and they broke bread in each other's homes and they prayed. And they worshipped together every day. And thousands of people came to faith. We need to change. They knew they lived in a, well, they lived in a pre-Christian culture, didn't they? And they knew that. They carried it around in their very bones. There was a method, the multitude of choices about who you could worship and how you could worship, what you did with your body. Sexuality was not, it's not, not like we've suddenly discovered it in this generation. No, there was a multitude of ways you could express your sexuality in, in the birthplace of Christianity. There was a temple in every corner and probably a prostitute to go with it. There was a different way of being human. And Jesus came into that world and he was so frustrated that he came to rescue them from the dark world that they were a part of. And there was appalling economics at that stage as well. And there was slavery and oppression of all kinds. There was dehumanization of children and young people and, and also older people and, and the disabled and all kinds of things. And, and Jesus comes in to break open that, that world because he was frustrated enough to leave his temple in heaven and come down to the temple on earth and to remake the temple on earth. Does that make sense to you? That's the story we're living in. We need to learn it again. 
and feel the passion of it. Well, it's, so this is the main story, and the word is the gospel. And everyone say gospel to me. Gospel. Yeah, see, we're familiar with it, aren't we? It's, we know what it means, except we don't know what it means. Or at least we, it, doesn't, it doesn't wrap up our, our tongues very easily. And if, if I said to you, tell the person next to you what the gospel is, oh no, don't ask me that, that's going to be, that's going to ruin it, isn't it? That's going to... How am I going to know what we got? I mean, it's like, what do we say? And I was given as a kid a very simple gospel that I'm a sinner and I could be forgiven by Jesus because if I believed in Jesus dying for me on the cross that I could be forgiven and I could go to heaven when I die. Is that a gospel familiar to you? It's an interesting gospel and it's, it's, it's good in part, but it's not the whole gospel. It's not the gospel. Well, I discovered that it wasn't the gospel of Jesus. Can, can we agree that Jesus was smart? You know, would you agree? Not like smartly dressed, but, <laughs> but intelligent. Dallas Willard is the guy on the end. And if you ever get to read any of his books, I really recommend that. Or he's, he's gone to be with Jesus and he's asleep with him until his body gets resurrected on the final day. But, um, but he's an amazing guy and he, he, he's taught me so much and I'm so grateful for his life. And he says this, Jesus was smart. And he says, but rarely do we give, if you, put, if you do a word association again with Jesus, you very rarely get the word smart out of people or intelligent. But if he's not intelligent, well, why would he be your Lord? If he's not smart, why would you submit to him as someone of your great, the great wisdom in your life? And I just want to remind you what we know to be true. That he, well, let, do you know this guy? Steve Jobs, do you know him? If you did a word association and then would game with Steve Jobs, people would say intelligent, clever, sharp, or maybe smart. Can we assume that Jesus was at least as smart as Steve Jobs? <laughs> We'd agree, wouldn't we, in the room? At least as smart as him. And I would say, given that he made the heavens and the earth out of nothing, that makes him a little bit smarter than Steve Jobs. If he can turn water into wine, and if he can heal the sick, and cast out demons, and turn things around, and bear the weight of the sin on his shoulders, then that makes him even smarter. If he can walk on water, at least he knows a few things. What is this smartest man that ever lived? You see, Jobs began, he would come into dark rooms in his trendy black top and his cool jeans, and he would hold up little bits of technology, and this is an iPhone. <laughs> and there were magical moments, literally magical moments, and people would go, <gasps> they would go, and people would be taking pictures around the room, and loving it. Now, can you imagine Steve Jobs wondering beforehand what he was going to say as he enters this room with the lights and that yes, he's orchestrated every single moment of this moment. He's made it as good as possible because he's smart and he knows that this moment is going to be his first moment to deliver the news about this great news that he's got. This is an iPhone. He would have thought, what word shall I use? What name shall I call it? What shall it be? How shall I present it? How shall I demonstrate this is such great news? He would have thought about every single moment of that presentation and he would have made sure it was absolutely perfect. Can we assume that Jesus was at least as smart as Steve Jobs? Yes, we can. So when Jesus enters the world and he begins his ministry of proclaiming the good news, can you assume with me, yes, you can, that he's going to be at least as smart and he's going to put some thought into what he's going to say. So what was his gospel? Well, we know what his gospel was. Except we don't know what his gospel was. It's not often on the top of our, our, our lips. In fact, I didn't know it for years, so even though I had a gospel. In fact, I had a gospel about Jesus. Have you got a gospel about Jesus, or have you got Jesus' gospel? It made me think, because when I got asked that question, I, I had to unravel a few things. I said, why? I don't know. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, what was Jesus' good news? Well, here it is in Mark, Mark 1, 14, 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news of God. Evangelion. But you or something. And here it is. The kingdom of God is at hand. The smartest man that ever lived has some fantastic news for the world. And it was that the kingdom of God is available for you right here, right now. Right here, right now, God's kingdom is invading the kingdom of this earth. The kingdom of the air has been pushed back. The prince of the world has been pushed back. And God's kingdom is coming right here, right now. And then he said after this, repent, rethink your ways of living. I had interpreted repent as, um, as um, 
saying sorry. It means more than saying sorry. It's a, it's a, it's a rethinking, repose, repose. It's to rethink. Uh, metanoia is the Greek word. Noia is a thinking word. You get, uh, paranoia from the same root. It's a thinking thing. And meta means again, again think. To rethink something in the light of this great news is what Jesus was offering his people. He said, this is incredible. God's kingdom is right at hand. Rethink the way that you live and enter this kingdom of God. Trust it. Trust me as the king of this kingdom. So what is this kingdom? Because I think there's a bit of ambiguity amongst us as, as, as churches about the kingdom of God. In fact, uh, uh, people can be taught about the kingdom of God for years and then they still don't really know how to talk about it. And we don't talk about it with our kids either. Very much. We don't talk about it. Unpack it for them. So I've been trying to work out over the last number of years and I'm still struggling to work out how do I talk about the kingdom of God. But I, I use this phrase. The kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will. It's where God gets what God wants. Does that make sense to you? Just as you have a will. Do you have a will? Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> you feel it in the coffee queue, don't you? <laughs> How long does it take to get a cup of coffee? <laughs> Come on, just move on to the milk. Come on, just move on. That is the expression of your will. Have you felt that this morning yet? Or was it just me? I confess. <laughs> I wasn't feeling that badly about it. I exaggerated for effect, you understand. But that's our will, isn't it? And wouldn't it be great to have your will done on earth? And so when you get married, you discover that there is another person in the world who also has a will. And then you have to work out what it means to work together, because two of you have a will. And, and then you have other little people, and they have wills as well. <laughs> And there's a fight going on for which kingdom is going to win. <laughs> yes, we understand this. It's true, yes. So, kingdoms are where every kingdom has a king. And it has people in it who do the will of the king. And if the king says something and it gets done, then that's inside the kingdom. If the wife says something and it gets done, it's within her kingdom. <laughs> if it gets said and it doesn't get done... It's outside her domain. Mm -hmm. It's a frustration to her, but she wa wants it to come, but it doesn't quite happen in the way that she wants it. So she keeps exerting herself until that thing comes in the way. Jesus comes and he says, my, will, my, my Father's will is going to be done right in front of your eyes. It's at hand. Would you like it? Here it is, right here, right now, for you. You can be poor. Blessed are you who are poor. You don't have to earn it. Here it is. It's a gift. It's a free gift for you right now. You can be mourning, you can be broken, it's right here for you, it's available for you. In fact, some are, strangely, for those who think that they've already got it, it won't be for you, it'll be for those who don't think they've got it, who really need it, who are desperate for it, and it's for you. But it's where God gets what God wants to do. So here is the kingdom of God, the domain of God's will, and it really helped me to think of it as a dome, because the word kingdom has got dome in it. And it made, so I, as I heard myself talk, or maybe the guy who I heard it first talk about it, he maybe did something like the kingdom of God, and he went like that, and I said, oh, that's... And I drew my drawing in my notebook. It's the kingdom. Yes, that makes sense. And, and now, so that's what I do. I draw this top hat. And it's the, kind of the kingdom of God. It's my little icon of the kingdom. And then, and, and then so Jesus is saying, here, here am I. Here's the domain where God gets what God wants in the world. And it's all around me. It's centered on me. I'm the bringer of this kingdom and I'm going to articulate this, this kingdom. And it's, it's all my message. It's all I want to do is to invite you into it. I want to describe it. I want to tell you pictures about what this kingdom is like. I'm, in fact, that's all that Jesus talked about. A hundred times it's, the narrative is all about the kingdom. And everything was pointing towards the kingdom. And then he sent his disciples out and he told them, you go and proclaim the kingdom and also do, do some stuff where it looks like God's getting what God wants, which looks like healing, doesn't it? It looks like healing every single time, doesn't it? Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God and then bodies are made straight. It's like, it's like our backs get straightened up when we're in the presence of something that is good. And, so, and it's the healing is just happening. It's, people are getting straightened because God's will is being done on their bodies. Uh, he describes one person as having who has scoliosis and he says, Satan has, has had their reign over this person, a hold on this person for too long. I've come to heal them. He did it on the Sabbath. Do you remember that story? He did it on a rest day. And they were all upset about the fact he'd done it on a rest day. 
He said, well, God's kingdom comes in a beautiful way. It can happen on a rest day as well, because God's kingdom is alive. It comes to restore people, to save people out of the grip of Satan. And so he, he tells stories, and then he does things like that healing, and then, of course, he casts out the enemy, pushes the enemy, and they all know what's coming, don't they? They all know they're going, ah, here comes Jesus, ah. And, he, and he's confronting them because God wants territory back. And he tells a story of, of uh, people who have a house. And he says, if you want to take ownership of, if you're a landlord and someone's got ownership of the house and they've taken root in the house, you've got to tie that person up in order to get the house back. You've got to, and he, he's talking about the enemy there. He's talking about, you've got, to, you've got to bind him up in order to take the house back. And he wants his home back. He wants to fill it with good things. He wants to get rid of the enemy. And then, of course, he does forgiveness of sin, which is, which is a beautiful thing, which is something that ties us all up in so many things, isn't it? The sin stuff, the stuff that's not anyone else's fault. It's our stuff, and it multiplies out. And just so frustrating, isn't it, the way that sin multiplies so quickly. You know, a lie becomes a bigger lie, becomes a bigger lie. You know, one thing leads to another, and it's, it's so frustrating in our lives, isn't it? And it ruins us. But Jesus comes to clean the slate and wash us clean and cover over the shame and forgive us he does that. And that feels good. It's, it's where God gets his world back. Remember, is this resonating with you? And this is what happens for each individual that happens. And so people come into the kingdom and they discover this reality. And they begin to live in it. And they feel themselves growing and experiencing the grace of God. And it feels good. They're repenting and believing and moving into this kingdom. And then they become people who own the kingdom and begin to express it. They're not building the kingdom like it's theirs to build, it's, but they're rather they're entering it and receiving it like a gift and expressing it like, like, like when you learn a language, you suddenly start expressing the language as if it's your own. And they begin to learn the language of the kingdom and they begin to express it. Uh, have you been to Ikea? <laughs> Yeah, they, they work on the same principles as Jesus. I don't know if they know this, but uh, this, is, this is how it works. Uh, it, it, the way that uh, IKEA is beautifully designed, uh, really cleverly. I mean, every, lots of things are designed in IKEA. Everything is designed. It's very intentional, isn't it? It doesn't just happen, except for the words that they use to describe them. They're just random. They, I think they watch Countdown and they just <laughs> they take the syllables and the vowels in any order and then just, just call it that. <laughs> Imagine, yeah, anyway, don't get distracted. Anyway, so you work, if you go to Ikea, the Ikea in Bristol is, I think it's designed like every other, but they, there's a car park, the lower dungeon, the darker area. Do you know this grey area underneath where nothing is particularly nice? It's good to go like a car park and you go into there and then you come out of the darkness, you come out of the darkness and there's an escalator that takes you to the, have you noticed that the, the dark is grey and then there's the blue bit with the yellow light, the sunshine in the building, have you noticed this? And then you, so you come up the escalator into the heavenly world. <laughs> and you enter the kingdom of Ikea. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, the kingdom of Ikea? Because it's got their children in it, except for other people's. You know, so, but it hasn't... Well, don't take your own children to Ikea, because that ruins the effect. But it's got no, it's got no clutter in it. Everything's tidy. And it's beautiful. And you walk around these rooms, and you feel like, I want to live in this house. I want to live in this room. Look at this. It's great. And you find, you find grown men sitting down on sofas, Playing with remote controls that don't work and <laughs> pretending they're watching television, relaxing, imagining their lives. They're reimagining their lives in the reality of this kingdom. And you walk around these things that, and it kind of it's infectious, isn't it? It's just like room after room you become IKEA fied. You just begin to want to live in this kingdom, this domain. And they take you into an experience of the reality of IKEA. And then you come out of this place and then you have a nice snack lunchtime with some meatballs and some <laughs> really nice things. I mean, we all love that bit, don't we? We get fed. It's interesting. To, you know, Jesus does the same. Gives you a taste of the kingdom and then he leaves us with a meal. I'm stretching it out to you too much, but he understands. And, and then we go into the, that day of the, the world where we have to transfer our allegiance to this thing. We have to give our lives, we have to die to ourselves. And we think, how on earth did five candle packs of candles and some pop plums come to 60 quid? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we have to empty ourselves in order to purchase the kingdom. But we leave, do you notice, we leave with joy. 
we sell our fields and buy the field of great treasure because it's good for us. And, we feel, and then we come home with our stuff, we unpack it, put it together, we try and unpack it and put it together. <laughs> and then we invite our friends around. And they go, wow, you've been to Ikea. Yes, we've been to Ikea. <laughs> and they then become evangelized by the good news of Ikea. <laughs> and they set off on their own little heavenly journey. <laughs> and so on and so forth. The kingdom of Ikea, come on earth as it is in heaven somewhere. Now, I tell the story because it's important for us to understand how this thing works. It works in a very tangible way and people don't, they don't tell you the story of Ikea, they give you the experience of Ikea. <coughs> he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Can you see what Jesus is telling you? There's going to be a, a seed planted in the earth, the kingdom of God. It's going to be a small thing, almost invisible. In fact, you wouldn't even notice it if you looked but it's going to grow into the biggest of plants. See, look, actually, I've given you half the story because the kingdom of God doesn't just exist on its own. It's a bigger kingdom that the kingdom of God enters. And it's called the kingdom of darkness in Scripture. The present evil age is the words that Paul used in his description of Galatia. And this is the world we're born into. This is the narrative that we need to own and share with our friends and neighbours. And this is the... I think it's fair to say that we experience this on a daily basis just by watching the news or living life. It feels hard. You don't have to scratch much in people's lives to discover the pain or the difficulty that they're facing. Am I, am I right? And even good things can be tarnished. I mentioned this morning, that I think it was this morning or it was last night, but that Mother's Day is difficult for people, isn't it? Because, because associated with the goodness of mothering and all of the benefits of that and the great things we're grateful for, there is also the pain of all of that as well. Because life is hard. Life is full of complexity and brokenness. But that's not how God wants it to be. Would you agree with me? In the beginning, he created it and it was good and pure. And there is something in the heart of a human being that knows this, is there not? There is a heart in, inside the heart of every child that says, it's not fair. There is something wrong. Uh, the question is, what's wrong? Is it them out there? Is it the government? Is it America? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to deny it, you see. You know, the kingdom of darkness is all around us. It's closer than we think, and it permeates every single family. Ask people how their families are, they'll soon tell you. But they won't describe it, because they don't want judgment. Nobody wants judgment. But there is a power bigger than us that's ruining our lives. Sometimes it's inside us. Sometimes it's ours, it's not anyone else. Sometimes it's the world around us. The culture around us. I was talking to the head of sixth form and he was telling me that he was going to have to leave my assembly early and he wanted to apologise before and not so that I didn't take it personally. As soon as I start speaking, he drifts off. <laughs> but he said, I've got to go and sort out some kids that have been posting some stuff on, online. Now these kids are just normal kids, they're not particularly bad kids. But he said it's become commonplace for people to take pictures of themselves and post each other online. And it's become commonplace to take pictures of other people and to ridicule them online. It's become commonplace. In fact, I hate, I hate YouTube, he said. I hate YouTube. For, my, for the 14-year-olds, the 15-year-olds, the 16-year-olds. I hate it, what it's doing to them. And I, It's bigger than me, and I hate it. It's the world we live in. And then there's a power outside of that. And, it, and we, we call this Satan or the devil or the princes of the air or principalities and powers. And these are big things. And we don't really know how to talk about them. But Jesus knew that they were real. And, and I think people know that... In fact, I think people... I'm just doing Alpha this week, and we finished off, and people believe in the enemy almost easier than they believe in God. So I think, I think there's a potential for us to join the dots to people and say, we live in the kingdom of darkness. The question is, I mean, they experience the reality of that. The question is, who's to blame? Well, I believe that there's a God. The story that I believe is that God knows that there's, there's some bad thing that's happened, and it's taken over our world, and it's, it's the snake and us are part of the story. But he, he loves us so much that he doesn't want to destroy us. 
Because if he took it out on us, then he, he doesn't want to take it out on us. He loves us. He's frustrated with the way the world is, but he doesn't want to take his frustration out on us. He wants to restore us and redeem us and rescue us. So in comes Jesus. He brings the seed of the kingdom of God, the domain of God's will. He invites people to enter it so that they begin to express this kingdom in every part of their lives, in their workplaces, in their families, internationally and nationally and in their locality. And they just begin to express it in their schools and colleges. And this grows. It's going to become the big... In fact, there's going to be a day when, when, when the glory of the Lord will, will fill everything and there won't be any darkness left. And Jesus will be at the centre of everything else. It's the picture of the holy temple over, over everything. It's, everything has become the temple again. <laughs> they do the same thing. They want to see their kingdom grow. They want to see the kingdom of Ikea grow. And it happens one by one as you tell the good news of Ikea to your friends. And you demonstrate it by bringing it into your lives and living with it and sharing it. And then you multiply it by sharing it. It's, it's not difficult to be an evangelist for something you like. Is it? Have you heard about my baby? Or have you heard about my holiday? Have you heard about the book I'm reading? It's just normal for us to tell good things about good things. So the question is, why do we not evangelize about Jesus? It's because he must be not as good as other things. I can't think of any other reason why we don't talk about him. It must be because we're not living with the reality of his impact in our lives. Paul, an apostle, said, not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ, saying, God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the other brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in West Bridgeford, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Do you see how Paul has, has brought in all his gospel narrative into a very short sentence right at the beginning of this letter? This is the gospel narrative in a little condensed version of it. In fact, I looked this morning as I was getting up from that. I wasn't woken up. It wasn't uh, a woodpecker, it was a pheasant that woke me up. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I got my Bible open and I was inquisitive about the gospel and how often Paul talks about the gospel. And if you read through AEIOU, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians, that's how I remember AEIOU, that's how I remember those five books. And you discover the first chapter of each, he talks about the gospel. His concern is about the gospel, about people losing the gospel or forgetting the gospel, not living up to the gospel. His, his whole ministry is shaped by the gospel. In fact, that's what he says, I, all I want to be known for is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And I wonder if that's true of me, and I wonder if it's true of you, whether you're known for the gospel, whether, whether you're a gospel person, through and through. It's a challenge, isn't it? And It's a good challenge, though. I want you to hear that challenge in a good way, because God, the world needs people who have good news. Doesn't it? Need people who have good news, rather than just bad news. <coughs> who are the good news tellers about Brexit? Who are the good news tellers in divorce? Who are the good news tellers in your street? Who are the good news who are going to help people to work out how to use the internet properly and protect themselves? Who are the people who are going to bring good news in their communities? Who who are they? Who are they? and where and who's look? We're all looking for people who bring good news, and we're the ones who are given good news in Jesus Christ, and He wins. He wins. Even death doesn't hold him. Can't keep him down. So we have nothing to fear. Let's bring the good news with confidence. But let's see that we are drawing people out of a present evil age into a new <coughs> kingdom, the kingdom of the Son, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Colossians chapter 1. See? Chapter 1 of Galatians. Colossians chapter 1. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. The, the gospel that I was talking about, forgiveness of sins, is not, not there. It's crucially part of the central, of the kingdom of God, where God gets what God wants. Is a fundamental part of that is the forgiveness of sins. I need to be cleansed and washed and restored, and, and I need all that dirt removed. But I mean, I need that for myself, but I also, I mean, God doesn't want me to come into his presence with that stuff as well, because it, it's like it doesn't, oil and water don't mix, so he needs that cleansed from him. Uh, but it, it's that he wants to restore me into the trueness of my identity, which he created me in. I was made to be a representative of the King of Kings, an icon of his glory. I was made in the image of God, and somehow I've got polluted by a whole load of other stuff, and I need that forgiveness, and I need to be liberated from the power of sin, which controls my life, rather than, rather than the things that I want to do, I do the things I don't want to do. Does this mean true with any of you? <laughs> 
So we need to be liberated from the power of sin and the pollution of sin and the penalty of sin. I deserve stuff. I deserve to be told off. My driving is appalling. And other things too, which I don't want to confess to you right now. <laughs> so where does, how does God deal with his frustration about all these things? Does he, take, does he take me out? No, he doesn't take me out, but rather he takes, he takes it all upon himself. And he fights that battle, and the enemy thinks it's taken him out. But instead, Jesus has won the victory and he beats the enemy. That's the story of the cross, isn't it? It's the story of the power. We need that, but it's part of the, the bigger story of the kingdom. Because he wants to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Why would he ask us to pray that if it already, if it already was here? He wouldn't ask us to pray for something that already existed, would he? <coughs> doesn't exist yet and we need to pray for it to, to come and we're the ones who have this in our in our grasp it's right at hand he says do you trust me do you believe me in the war against the enemy jesus drops grace bombs i made up that phrase grace bombs it's an oxymoron isn't it grace and bomb <coughs> think of the woman at the well the leper the blind man Peter's mother-in-law, the woman whose son had died in the funeral cortege. <coughs> These are grace bonds where he gets back the he gets back the world, he gets back people one one at a time. The woman caught in adultery. Wow, what a story! Grace bond, and we get to be we get to be deliverers of these grace bonds in our workplaces, in our lives, and in our families. Which is your favourite grace bond story in the New Testament? Which is the one that moves your heart? Maybe, maybe tonight as you go to sleep, you'll get that story out, find it, and, and then and then imagine yourself being someone who could repeat that story to someone else, offer that grace to them, and maybe a healing. And you think, well, I've never really done much healing. I've never prayed for many people before, but I'd love to do that. Yeah, let. Let that seed fall in you so that you become an expression of the kingdom of God because that's what it looks like when God gets what God wants. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's someone who's possessed and overrun by a power bigger than themselves and, you, and that's a story that's powerful for you and you think, oh, I'd love to be able to bring release and freedom to the oppressed in some way. That's my story. Maybe you could ask God, how could I be part of that? Or maybe it's bringing forgiveness <coughs> to sin to people who have been caught up in stuff. That are you with me on this? Does this make sense? Find your own calling in it. Because you're the apostles now. You're the sent ones. You're the missionaries. Okay? He hasn't got anyone else. He really, I mean, there, there aren't that many of us left. This is us. This is our calling. There's a picture of chocolate cake behind there. You can't see it. It just looks like, I don't know what it looks like. Um, I, I went on holiday to um, south of Spain in August. <laughs> yes, it was hot, <laughs> and, uh, and we had a had a house, a little cottage with a with a pool, a tiny little pool, but it was a pool. And, and uh, eight o'clock in the morning was about the latest you could stay out before it got too hot and you had to go inside. <laughs> but we went swimming in the morning, and then and then we just sweat the rest of the day <laughs> until about ten o'clock at night. We would go to the little villages, the white villages of Andalusia. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Beautiful, really fantastic. <clears throat> And it was owned by this rather splendid English couple, expat couple, who lived and bought a house on the hillside overlooking. Um, the, the, down below was the, the coastline, Brengaroda or something like that. I don't know if that's right. Malaga was a little way off. And, uh, anyway, so it was, it was a very beautiful, elevated view, and the breeze was coming up. And they had this amazing house, and they invited us for, for drinks on their terrace. And, uh, and we were very grateful. And uh, we went and Every day we driven, we had our little cottage and, and our little white house, and, they, and then next to us was another little white house, and, and in that white house there were some, they rented that out as well, and there were some nudists in that white house. <laughs> the kids noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, and the, the driver went past the nudist garden, and, uh, and every time, we, well, the first time, we went, what's that really? What do you want? <laughs> and, and then, then, of course, every time we drove, because that was the only way out, we had to drive past the nudists, and of course, the expectation and anticipation was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and we drive really, Did you see? Yes, I saw it. I saw it. I, saw it. <laughs> I do. You have something so sweet and so much fun. It's <laughs> It was, it was bad. It was really 
joke, and then, and then, so we driven past these leaders who we'd seen in all their glory. <laughs> and, uh, and then we got to shake their hands in real life at this, at this little drinks thing that they'd had. We shook their hands, and they were fortunate they'd put their clothes on, so we shook their hands. We had a really nice evening, and it was, it was just a beautiful evening with breeze coming up the valley, and, and, and this woman who had done this for years, she told us this story of a German who used to come and stay in one of her houses, or when she had people to stay in the house, grand, beautiful house, fantastic, with a staircase that kind of came on both ways, and he... And this German would love this English woman, and love the English tea, and he, she used to make cake, English cake, which is unusual in hot Spain. And, uh, and, and he, he came and, and she gave him cake, and, and then one year he came back and she'd stopped doing the house thing, and he'd just arrived, and he said, I don't know if I could stay, and she said, well, we don't do that anymore, and, but just because they built a relationship over so many years, she said, yes, you can come and stay for a bit. And, and he sat down and, 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 and he was waiting. And she said, are you okay? He said, yes, I am thinking about the chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, I'm thinking about the chocolate cake. And uh, she remembered that she used to always bring the chocolate cake. And he had a taste, and this was like, he'd taken his bags, put them in the hall, and he, was, he sat down waiting for the chocolate cake. And I share that only because I like chocolate cake too. And, and I've never known anyone who's given me a recipe for chocolate cake. No one's ever given me a recipe for chocolate cake. They've only ever given me chocolate cake. And I've never asked anyone for a recipe of chocolate cake. I've only ever asked someone for chocolate cake. And I wonder if the same is true for us with the kingdom of God. I don't think people are interested in the recipe for the kingdom of God. I think they're interested in the reality of the kingdom of God. It's not about the recipe, it's about the chocolate cake. If people have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, they will want more. So we need to carry not the recipes or the theologies. I don't think it's about theology. I think it's about the experience of the kingdom. And I think this is true for us in the room as well, because I think we've had a lot of it well, the theology about the kingdom. I mean, here we are sitting in a lecture room as if, as if all the words are going to make a difference to our, the way that we actually live. <laughs> I'll take that as an amen. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's a sign from the Lord to carry up. Um, <laughs> What I'm wondering about is whether we've had an experience of the chocolate cake, an experience of the reality of the kingdom of God. For those of us in the room who have had an experience of the kingdom of God, who know what it is, knows what it is to be rescued from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son, the one who loves, we actually find it a lot easier to share our good news with other people because it feels real to us. And don't feel condemned by that. Just feel the pull of Jesus towards you. This is how Jesus worked. He demonstrated the kingdom of God in front of people. He said things that revealed the gap between where they were and where they wanted to be. And he let it hang there for a while. And then he said, would you like the kingdom? And people said, yes. And he stepped towards him. And there was this little guy in the tree. You remember him? He could see this thing. And he thought, I... And he walked towards Jesus. And Jesus said, come and have tea with me. It's in chocolate cake. <laughs> And he gave him a taste of the chocolate cake, and what did that do to his life? It made him a, made him a missionary, and it made him a kingdom person. He began to share this good news <coughs> with other people. He couldn't help it, could he? He became a son of Abraham. None of us are disqualified from this. In fact, the more vulnerable and broken you are, the more aching and thirsty you are, the better it is. Blessed are you who are mourning, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who thirst and hunger for righteousness, for yours. It belongs to you. So this is our new story. Do you know, at baptism, we, um, we do this thing with, with water that we also do with the cross, just after people get baptized, and we say, do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. What do we say next? Does anyone know? Life and me as a disciple of Christ against sin. We know these words, don't we? They're familiar to us. 
Do you notice that as soon as someone is baptised, we baptise them into Jesus and into the battle? It's our story. It's a, it's, it's a ritualised version of the Gospel. Rescued out of darkness, dead, dies to it, resurrected, commissioned into ministry. It's the, it's the whole narrative in a very few actions and a very few words. If we need to reclaim these words of ourselves, you might want to pray this over yourself. Do not be ashamed, Richard, to confess the faith of Christ crucified, the one who gives himself away. But fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin in you. Fight against sin. Don't let it take any foothold in your life. Fight against it, like your life depends on it. Fight against the world, not against people, but against the influence of this world. Discipline yourself. Run the race. Take it seriously and fight against the enemy. Take territory off him. Make it your life's ambition to make a difference. <coughs> it's a good prayer, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. It's lasted for 2,000 years. <coughs> this is our main story. It's the story of the kingdom of God. Would you like it in one word? <laughs> <laughs> it's enough, isn't it? <coughs> Can you summarise the gospel in one word? Jesus. Two words. Should we go for three words? Seven words. How about seven words? How about thirty words? You like thirty words? <laughs> Jesus is God with us. Come to show us God's love, set up God's kingdom, shut down religion, and save us from sin, so we can share our gospel. I think there are a few seven-year-olds and a few sixteen-year-olds and a few thirty-six-year-olds and a few seventy-year-olds who are desperate for that kind of good news. There is a God who loves us enough to come to us, show us his love. It's beautiful, isn't it? Sets up God's kingdom, shuts down all our efforts to try and earn this thing and make this thing, liberates us from the power of sin, the power of sin, pollution of sin so that we can live the kind of life that God intended right at the very beginning of the story. Now apparently Jesus would give his life for this story. He's just looking for one or two others who would do the same, pick up the cross, follow me, and give their lives for the same story. It'll be like a mustard seed. It will be small and vulnerable, but it will grow into the biggest of trees. It will transform the world one person at a time. So, we're going to sing together, but uh, before we do, why don't we just take a moment?